I uh, want to draw your attention to uh, the point in the chat, which is if there are any issues, uh, the phone number, which is a plus one country code uh, for the US or the email. Um, uh, we have Anton here for support uh, for AV. We're very grateful. Um, welcome everyone to the June uh, ISA Red webinar. My name is Lindsay Morton and uh, I have the privilege of getting to um, moderate this webinar because I'm part of the webinar working group in ISO Red uh, and different um, members of the webinar working group uh, take turns, although it's going to be my turn a couple times in a row here. Uh, it's, um, uh, ISO Red, I feel like, is uh, really kicking off in a wonderful way. And over the last half of half year, we have had a series of webinars with the goal of um, showcasing the different radiation, epidemiology, and dosimetry groups around the world uh, to try and promote connections uh, and help everyone understand the different uh, groups that are contributing to this research area that we're also interested in. Uh, so it's really my pleasure to welcome the group from IS Global, the Barcelona Institute for Global Health today uh, to be presenting. And we will start off uh, Dr. Isabel terry uh, who's an Associated Research Professor and Head of the Medical Radiation Group at IS Global, will begin by giving an overview of their program. So Isabel, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so the radiation program at IS Global was built in 2008 with main objective to better understand the potential risk associated to exposure to radiation and provide evidence that serves radiation protection. So we are developing projects on both ionizing and non-ionizing radiation to study cancer and non-cancer effects. Our current main topics of research are uh, medical exposure, environmental and um, uh, crisis, disasters, preparedness, surveillance, and resilience, occupational exposure, which covers both ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, electromagnetic fields, and UV. Uh, the radiation program is establishing creative collaboration within IS Global with other programs. So the childhood and environment, air pollution and urban environment, uh, non-communicable diseases and the environment, and more recently, viral and uh, bacterial infection with a project on uh, tuberculosis. We are also heavily engaged with our teams in policy and global communication and stakeholder engagement. Recently, uh, IS Global was awarded as uh, Severo Ochoa Center of Excellence, which allowed us to uh, strengthen and develop further in, uh, in uh, the following topics, mental health, social and economic impact, uh, health impact assessment, e-health and biomedical data science. I want to strengthen also uh, the very uh, nice and important team that we have at uh, IS Global, the pre-award team, who are very, very helpful in uh, setting up proposals for um, a new projects and for fellowship. A few highlights. So the first one on UV, we are developing monitoring and, and modeling approaches to study both adult and pediatric uh, population exposed to UV with uh, um, assessing novel endpoints. As I already mentioned, uh, on uh, occupational uh, exposure, we are uh, having studies on uh, non-ionizing and ionizing radiation, studying both workers and the offsprings. And we have long, we have for a long time, uh, with Elizabeth being involved in nuclear worker studies, we are evaluating the possibility to also set up a court of medical professionals. Uh, so in the Talk today, Elizabeth will be presenting um, the Moby Kids study, uh, EMF and Child Health. Uh, immediately after Elizabeth, I will be presenting our new project on medical exposures to ionizing radiation, and Ludmila will be uh, prepare, presenting um, uh, cra uh, crisis uh, uh, preparedness uh, uh, after nuclear accidents. So here is our full team with uh, the PI, the statisticians, the PhD, 
uh, students currently in the group, the project manager, their assistants, and some of our students who were left in uh, in recent years. And I uh, give the floor to Elizabeth now. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen now. Uh, all right. Uh, just one second. So, Elizabeth, while you're working on sharing your screen, I can okay. Do, do you a, see it? Very. Yes. Okay. I can do just a very quick introduction. We're delighted to have the first of these three scientific talks um, by Elizabeth Cardis, who is the head of the radiation program. Um, Thank you. Thank you, actually, Lindsay. I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't see your slides, Elizabeth. Ah. What What can you see? Right now, just your video. Okay. Uh... Looks like you're starting to share and now? now. Yes. Okay. Is it full screen? Not yet. That no. now it looks great. Okay, perfect. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you, Lindsay, and thanks everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today and to take part in this uh, in this webinar. And um, we very much hope to see you in person next year at the first in person ISOHED meeting, which we hope we will be able to host um, near Barcelona in CJS next May. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the results of the MobiKid study, which is a study on the effects of uh, radio frequency radiation in young people. Just a bit of background, first of all, uh, you know that the use of mobile communication devices during childhood and adolescence has grown dramatically in the last 15 years or so. And, and there's clear benefits that are really non-negligible especially to those of us who have children, uh, in terms of emergency communication with family. I see more and more now in my teenagers that this is really important also for schoolwork, agendas, education, and of course, communication with friends and entertainment. But there has been uh, for a long time concerns about potential risks. Uh, and of particular importance are risks on uh, of cognitive and behavioral effects and of a brain and CNS tumors in general. And um, I'd like to remind you that the IARC uh, monograph uh, in 2011 evaluated RF as a possible carcinogen, uh, mainly on the basis of um, studies of brain tumors in relation to wireless, wireless phone use. Uh, the Interphone study, which is a multinational study that I coordinated when I was at IARC, and some studies by Leonard Hardell in Sweden. At present, the health effects of RF are not demonstrated, but if there's a risk, it is likely to be greater for exposures in childhood and adolescence. And you might ask why? Well, first of all, because the children who start using phones will have much more exposure simply because they were using the phones for many more years uh, than people like me who started later on in life. Uh, they use them a lot more because it's much, much cheaper than when mobile phones started in the 1980s and 1990s. Also, we know that exposure in childhood to many environmental agents, uh, environmental carcinogens, um, uh, has, uh, entails higher risk of cancer than exposures later in life. And also, in terms of radiofrequency radiation here, for the same use of a phone, for the same conversation with a phone using the same power in any frequency band, we say that the maximum um, SAR, so the specific absorption rate, uh, in the most exposed part of the brain tends to be about twice as high for a child using a phone compared to an adult with the red bar. So basically, there is concern that if there's a risk, it could be larger. So um, we set up uh, over 10 years ago um, to conduct a case control study with the objective of assessing the risk of brain tumors in young people in relation to childhood and adolescent exposure to EMF from communication technologies. Uh, this is a case control study of benign and malignant brain tumors in persons aged 10 to 24. This was complementing the previous interphone study where we focused on ages 30 to 55, which are people who were more kind of business persons. Um, the study started in the earliest country in 2010, most of the countries in 2011, and, went, and we had a case ascertainment until the end of 2015. 
And uh, in order to prevent a possible uh, survival bias, uh, we tried to have rapid ascertainment of uh, new cases directly from diagnosing and treatment hospitals. Because we know that uh, participation of population-based controls uh, in epidemiological study in this age range is very, very poor, we decided to go for hospitalized controls. Um, and we chose controls, people who had been operated for an appendicitis which uh, is fairly frequent in the age range of interest, and it's not related to socioeconomic status and it appears not to be related to mobile phone use either. We chose two controls per case and they were matched on age, sex, and region. The study was conducted in 14 countries uh, with European Commission funding in Europe and with separate funding in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, India, Korea, and Japan. And we at ES Global were the coordinators. Uh, we had a very detailed study questionnaire that, of course, asked about general information, the detailed information about mobile and cordless phone use, information about other wireless communication devices, exposure to other sources of EMF, so non-communication, and information on many other potential risk factors for brain and CNS tumors, including exposures uh, of the parents so during the pregnancy and preconception. Um, we were very concerned, this is a case control study, about possible uh, recall biases. So we uh, had several studies or sub-studies to assess uh, and validate self-reported mobile phone use um, to characterize and quantify potential recall errors, especially if it was differential. So we had one study which is based on historical traffic or billing records from the providers for the cases and the controls who agreed uh, to let us uh, contact their uh, mobile phone prevent, uh, providers. And they provided information on frequency and duration of voice and data use for several years uh, prior to um, the cases and controls being um, enrolled. We had also some validation of laterality during the interview. And we also had a software modified uh, study called Ex Mobi Expo uh where we installed uh, uh, uh an app on android phones we tried to develop it also for um for ios but that was very very complicated and so these were installed on the mobile phones of volunteers and also of the controls who agreed to participate in and here we could inform get information about frequency and duration of voice and data use laterality hands free use uh, in order to validate um, the information that we get in questionnaires and to inform about use patterns in this population. Uh, we had a number of other sub-studies, including a non-response questionnaire, so people who did not agree to participate in the full study were asked to answer a few very brief questions so that we could assess a possible um, non-participation uh, response bias uh, and uh, take it into account in our analysis. Uh, we had a sub-study to validate tumor diagnosis, and also uh, for the vast majority of cases, we had one neurologist in each country review the diagnosing MRI or CT scans and mark the precise location of the tumors on um, specially developed grids. Here you see a grid for a child of 14 years old, so we had this grid for different age groups, so brains with different, slightly different configuration and slightly different sizes of head. And so basically the neuroradiologist could mark all of the cells in three dimensions um, occupied by the tumor. Uh, we also had an exposure assessment subcommittee because um, exposure to radiofrequency radiation from mobile phones is very, very localized. And uh, we know that from previous studies that just uh, looking at uh, numbers of calls or duration of calls it is a poor um, proxy for the actual dose received uh, by the brain. So basically, our exposure assessment subcommittee developed some algorithms to estimate uh, the dose from RF and from ELF at different locations of the brain from use of, of wireless phones. So here we looked at both mobile phones and cordless phones because both of these types of phones emit radio frequency radiation for communication and emit extremely low frequency fields also, mainly from the batteries that are used them. So we estimated RF and ELF dose at, in the brain uh, from the use of these phones and from uh, the use of other communication technologies. Um, we also looked at uh, exposure to EMF from other residential and occupational sources. 
And just briefly, uh, the algorithm uh, that was developed um, took into account well, the tumor lo localization so that we can identify the cubes in the brain where the tumor was. And then the uh, exposure subcommittee uh, conducted a lot of uh, simulations uh, based on different phones, different technologies, different positions of use, and different heads by different ages so that we could map the SAR into the cells of the brain where the tumor uh, was. That was uh, put together with historical information from network operators and information from questionnaire about the amount of phone use, the phone models, because different phone models uh, would, could irradiate different parts of the brain and the conditions in order to develop uh, estimates of the uh, cumulative specific absorption rates of RF uh, at the location of the tumor and the cumulative induced current density of ELF at that location. Okay, this is the first time I present the results. The paper has been submitted for publication quite recently. Uh, so there's always the possibility that with peer review, we might be asked to do some, some, some additional analysis and that results might change. So I'd be most grateful if you could uh, avoid citing or quoting these results until they are published. Uh, in total, we interviewed 899 and 1900 uh, eligible uh, 899 cases and 1900 eligible controls. This is a distribution by countries. You see that the uh, vast majority of cases came from Spain, Italy, Israel, and France. About 57% of cases were males. And this is the distribution by age range. Um, this does not completely reflect the age distribution of these tumors in the general population. What we saw is that participation rates were lower among the older. Uh, uh, in group than it was in, in the younger group. Now, um, we decided at first to include both benign and malignant tumors, and we found that, um, in fact, there's very few benign tumors in this age range, and that the vast majority of tumors are actually neuroepithelial tumors, so like 75% were the neuroepithelial tumors, and the majority of these were glioma. The second largest group was embryonal tumors with 129 you see very small numbers of meningiomas and of other non neuroepithelial tumors. So because we believe that the um, etiology of these different types of tumors may be quite different, we decided to focus on neuroepithelial tumors for our analysis, knowing that, of course, even that group may include entities that have different etiologies. Um, Quite interesting, so these are some descriptives uh, of, our, of the distribution of mobile phone use in our population. 89% uh, of our subjects uh, had or were classified as regular users of a wireless phone. Again, I'm saying wireless is both mobile and cordless. The vast majority were mobile phones. Um, and quite interestingly, 77% of the 10 to 14 years old were regular users. Uh, and virtually all of the 20 to 24 year olds. Um, the time since start in years, the median was 7.5 years, uh, ranging from five years in the youngest to 10 years in the oldest, with the 90th percentile being 14 years in the oldest. And the median cumulative call time, so the numbers of hours over their whole history of mobile phone use up to one year before the reference date was 177. Uh, you can see this very variable by age group. The 90th percentile in the oldest age group was 3,722 hours, which is over two, over two and a half times the 90th percentile in the interphone study of um, adults, uh, which uh, was the basis for the IR monograph evaluation. Uh, one of the major difficulties in our study, methodological difficulties, is age, because um, obviously, uh, the amount of phone use depends on, on, on age. And you can see here that these are quintiles of cumulative call time. The first quintile, we've put the non-regular users together the, with the first quintile, because as you see the older age groups, there's virtually nobody who's non-regular user. And what you can see here is most of the 10 to 14 years old are either non-regular users or in the first two quintiles, while most of the older ones are in the, in the highest quintiles. So that if we do analysis of general quintiles like that, we end up not really having much of a contrast in exposure uh, in our age groups, simply because they are too clustered uh, um, 
in these quintiles. So because we wanted to have uh, an exposure gradient to look at the possible effect, and because we thought the effect could be different in different age groups, our main analysis are based on age specific quintiles and not on um, general quintiles, although we have sensitivity analysis based on these general quintiles. So these are our main results. These are the odds ratios so for neuroepithelial brain tumors in relation to wireless phone use. So this is uh, the odds ratios by time since start of use. And you can see that the odds ratios tended to decrease with increasing amount of phone use. So with the odds ratio of 0 0.74 in the 10 years or more group. And we see the same pattern of a decreasing odds ratios with increasing um, uh, cumulative call time uh, with wireless phones. So that was quite puzzling, and we did a lot of work to try and understand where this came from. It turns out that uh, this, these results are mainly driven by the 15 to 19-year-old group. And in that group, um, the interviews, we had a mix of interviews. Some of them were interviews with a study subject, him or herself. Some of them were only with a parent. And then we had some that were mixed the subject with a parent. Um, and this is an age group that's very, very difficult in terms of recall because the parents of the 19 or 18 year olds don't know very much the use of their kids. Um, and the children in that age range may also not estimate their exposure very, very well. So we did some analysis look, excluding proxy. We also did analysis excluding five years before the reference dates uh, in, in case um, to rule out a possible prodromal effect by which a tumor might be present and that tumor may influence uh, the use of mobile phones by the subject because they have hearing problems or they have difficulties with the phones and so on. So if we exclude uh, proxy interviews or if we exclude five years before the reference date, we have odds ratios uh, that are very close to one in each category. And this here is uh, an analysis where we excluded both the proxies and the five years before the reference date. And you see that we have absolutely no uh, association between time since start or cumulative call time and uh, odds ratios for brain tumors. We did the same analysis in relation to RF and ELF dose. This is to the center of gravity of the tumor. We've also done it uh, to the uh, the average dose, which is, I mentioned was cumulative specific energy of RF or induced current density of ELF. Um, so we've done it, uh, the average dose at the level of the whole tumor. We've done it also in, in, in different ways, maximum in the tumor, et cetera. Again, what we see is a decreasing trend of odds ratio with increasing RF, uh, cumulative specific energy. Uh, not a trend, but reduced odds ratios for ELF. When we look at the 15 to 19 year olds, years old, we have a decreasing trend once again uh, for ELF. And again, when we exclude five years or exclude proxies, this decreasing trend disappears completely. And this, again, is the results of the analysis, excluding both the proxies and the five years. So you see that we have no apparent association, either increasing or decreasing trend. And odds ratio either uh, as a function of RF or as a function of ELF. Now, we've done a lot of sensitivity analysis. We don't have major differences by sex or by country. Here you see this is the uh, odds ratios by time since start of use overall. And by country, you see pretty much the same pattern of decreasing odds ratio with increasing time since start. We've done analysis of just mobile phones or just cordless phones, both in terms of, mobile phone, of, of uh, the history of use and of ELF and RF. No differences, really. Uh, we've looked at tumor location because much of the RF, for example, is absorbed in the first centimeters of the uh, temporal lobe. Um, and we found really no particular differences between the risk in the temporal lobe or the frontal, parietal, or other anatomical locations in the brain. No major differences either by tumor grade or by the adequacy of the recall judged by the interviewers or looking at general quintiles. Uh, we use the information from the non-response questionnaire to derive inverse probability weights. So we could take into account, we could adjust for potential non-participation selection bias. It had very, very little effect. Although we did notice that 
in our population, we tended to have a little bit more regular users and a little bit more heavy users um, than among those who had refused to participate, but that did not materially affect our risk estimates. Also little impact of uh, different analytical strategies or of excluding subjects with imputations. Um, so basically, this is the largest case control study of brain tumors uh, in relation to mobile communication technologies in young people that's been conducted to date. It's by far the largest number of long-term and heavy users in any uh, case control study. Um, one of the, I think, really important issues here is we've attempted to estimate the RF and the ELF dose to the tumor, to the center of gravity and to the tumor in general. Uh, and I should say that the agreement between RF and ELF dose and uh, wireless phone use uh, variables was actually moderate to poor overall. It's actually very, very, very bad for, for 3G. Um, what we've seen, as I mentioned, the odds ratios tended to decrease with increasing wireless phone use and with increasing RF, sorry, and ELF dose. Oh, no, RF dose, not so much with ELF. It wasn't, a, we didn't have a trend. This observation is mainly driven by what we've seen in the 15 to 19 years old, in apparent in the, which is, appears to be main, mainly explained by proxy interview, and also adjusting for possible prodromal uh, effect also uh, makes this uh, decreasing trend go away. So in conclusion, we have no evidence from this study of a causal association between wireless phone use and brain tumors. However, because of these decreasing trends and the likely biases in the study, we can't rule out a small increased risk. Um, so this is a picture from one of our consortium meeting. We don't have everybody here. This was at the end of meeting. Many people had taken their flight already. This is a cold winter day for us in Barcelona. We'd like to acknowledge all of the research assistants and all of the interviewers and the very many study centers the staff of all participating hospitals. There are a lot of hospitals. Just in Spain, we had over 50 hospitals. And imagine we had 14 countries, and most of all, the study participants and their families. And the manuscript, as I mentioned, is currently under review. We have um, a number of other publications already with the study protocol, a paper on the clinical presentation of the tumors, papers on the, the non-participation selection bias, on recall with another paper that's under review, um, and then uh, papers on patterns of phone use in this age group, as well as a number of papers which are now uh, being prepared, well, two of them published, others being prepared about uh, other risk factors, for example, ionizing radiation um, on the risk of brain tumors from this study. Thank you very much for your attention. That was really terrific, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. I'm sure everyone is really thrilled um, and appreciates your willingness to share the results at this stage. Um, so uh, I want to be mindful of giving the other speakers enough time, but there are a couple of questions that have already been put in the chat. And so I want to facilitate at least a brief discussion so that we can address some of these um, important questions. Uh, so the first one is, uh, did your response questionnaire account for how um, the children and adolescents use their phones, knowing that adolescents mainly text or watch content and rarely place the device next to their heads? Yeah, we had a question about data use, actually, but we had questions about mobile phone use. So actually, the main study questionnaire asked both about phone use for, for calling and about uh, other users of phones. And we did have one question in the non-response questionnaire about that. And can you confirm also that there was no increased risk in the youngest age group since there was this concern about the young age of exposure? Uh, yeah, I do confirm we did not have an increased risk. And our pattern was pretty much always decreasing trends, which was a, a very difficult one to address. Yeah. And actually speaking of that, the trends. Um, one of the other questions in the chat was about the, your approach of using quintiles in the analysis. Uh, did you consider using continuous measures um, uh, or also other measures like peak usage? Um, yeah, peak usage is something we've been discussing. We haven't tried. It's something we might try. It's, it, I think that's it, it's a very valid point. In terms of continuous measures, no, we're, we're really not 
sure what shape of dose response we, we would expect um, because for example for ELF people do use peak for example or, or, or time weighted averages and so on so we thought that we would start by using categorical uh, variables but um, we haven't done very much in terms of modeling I think we did one or two models just with the continuous variables both in terms of use and ELF and RF but found no associations well, that, that's great. I, I appreciate this, is, as I said, a terrific talk. Um, I know everybody's really excited to see the data. If people have additional questions, and there actually are a couple more in the chat, Elizabeth, perhaps you could actually just respond in the chat as well. Um, yeah, sure. And that way that dialogue can continue, but I want to move on um, and actually shift to medical exposure to ionizing radiation in childhood um, with Isabel Terrichef giving the results of the Harmonic Project. Can you hear me, Lindsay? Yes, we can hear you well. It's not in presentation mode yet, though. That's what I'm waiting for. Yes. If too long, we'll stop. Ah, here we are. Yes. Great. Looks great. So, um, in the medical radiation group, uh, we are studying so far exposure in childhood, and I will uh, introduce our new project, uh, Harmonic, uh, and unfortunately without any results because it's a very, very new project. Uh, but before that, I just want to summarize a little bit the context of, um, of this project. So, um, as you uh, probably all know, contribution of exposure from ionizing radiation due to medical procedures increased substantially between uh, 1980 and 2006, reaching uh, 48%. Uh, so, if we look into uh, diagnostic procedures, CT represent, uh, represented 50% of the effective dose in 2006 in the US and it reached 63% in uh, 2016. When we look at the pediatric population, uh, the uh, proportion goes up to 84% of the collective effective dose that is due to CT. So this is really to strengthen the importance of following up our uh, pediatric CT cohorts. But complementary to the CT studies are uh, studies of children treated with ionizing radiation in uh, therapeutic use of ionizing radiation, the benefits largely out, outweigh the uh, risk. However, late effects of exposure are important to understand in children with increased survival. So the Harmonic project is devoted to better understand the long-term health effects of medical exposure to ionizing radiation in, ch in children by building two uh, cohorts, a cohort of cancer patients treated with modern radiotherapy modalities and a cohort of cardiac patients treated with X-ray guided imaging procedures. Our uh, objective are to investigate late health effects of ionizing radiation in children, cancer and non-cancer outcomes. We are developing tools for long-term follow-up of uh, children exposed to ionizing radiation. We are developing uh, models for radiation dose uh, estimation. And we are also investigating possible biological mechanisms. The project will provide recommendations to optimize techniques and uh, reduce radiation doses. So the project is built around two main uh, work packages, a work package devoted to uh, radiotherapy and the other one devoted to cardiac catheterization with two transversal uh, uh, work packages on uh, dosimetry and uh, biology. The radiotherapy um, activities. So we are focusing on modern radiotherapy techniques. So the first one is an intensity modulated radiotherapy. 
In IMRT, uh, collimation is made of thin leaves of lead, which can be moved independently to fit precisely the treatment area. So uh, the tumor receives very high doses, while the uh, surrounding nearby uh, tissue receive much lower doses. And you can also vary the intensity uh, of radiation uh, across the tumors. However, there is there are still uh, relatively large volumes of uh, of the body or, or the su the surrounding area uh, exposed to low to moderate doses. In proton therapy, uh, protons are used rather than X-ray to treat the cancer. So the particles are deposited in a narrow um, range of depths, and it is more focused on the tumor. So there is less scattered radiation to LC nearby tissues. So the, the objective is to deliver very high radiation doses to the tumor while significantly decreasing radiation to nearby organs at risk. However, there is the um, uh, generation of secondary neutron uh, in, in, in surrounding uh, areas. So this figure shows um, the um, anticipated number of uh, proton therapy centers that will open by 2025 in, uh, in Europe and worldwide. So our objective in uh, Harmonic is to implement the infrastructure for a long-term long follow-up of a pediatric patient treated with modern radiotherapy techniques. And we want to investigate within the time frame of the project incidence and severity of health and social outcomes. So uh, we, uh, we focus on endocrine dysfunction, cardiovascular toxicities, neurovascular damages, secondary prim second primary cancer, and quality of life, educational and social outcomes. Our cohort is uh, uh, will will uh, uh, include about 2,700 children from Belgium, Denmark, France, and Germany, and we are uh, building the cohort both prospectively and retrospectively. In cardiology. Uh, so uh, just a, a, sh a small um, uh, explanation on, on, the, on the technique. So um, in cardiology, in cardiac catheterization, you introduce a small catheter into uh, the blood vessels to uh, treat a heart defect without surgery. So this decreases substantially the risk of complications for treatment of many congenital and acquired heart uh, diseases. And this also allows to treat very young patients. And obviously, the, X the radiation comes from the X-ray used for visualization. Uh, our objective within Harmonic is to build a cohort of about 100,000 pediatric patients uh, treated in Europe. Um, this study is based on the existing uh, cohorts in the UK and in France, and we are uh, uh, going to estimate those response relationship for leuke childhood leukemia, old childhood cancer, and uh, possibly other tumor located around um, the heart, so in the chest region, and we will assess impact of, of, of potential confounding factors. So the cohort uh, includes patients from Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Norway, Spain, and the UK, uh, with the French and the UK cohort contributing a lot uh, as they started earlier, and also the German uh, uh, cohort is also um, going to be quite uh, large, and it is based on the uh, healthcare database. In dosimetry, uh, we are developing tools to improve individual uh, uh, dose estimation to specific organs for both diagnostic and therapeutic exposure. So this is true for radiotherapy and cardiology. In both cases, we are also uh, performing on phantom measurements to validate our models and our data and tools will be used to support uh, optimization of uh, procedures. In biology, uh, we are working on uh, identifying biomarkers that are characteristics of patients at increased risk of developing um, late effects. 
and uh, we are um, working in uh, understanding uh, the mechanistics of uh, radiation induced uh, cellular response uh, that could be used further in uh, molecular epidemiological studies. So we investigate mechanisms and identify biomarkers in both population in parallel, so uh, radiotherapy and cardiology, and we are focusing on oncogenetic and uh, uh, vascular diseases. Uh, the protocol for the um, biology, so we are collecting both blood and saliva before treatment, immediately after treatment, and one layer after exp exposure. And we are exploring changes induced by radiation at the level of uh, the transcriptome, the proteome, the epigenome, and we are also studying inflammation and oxidative stress. So we um, uh, believe that harmonic will impact uh, the radiation protection community. We will provide information on the health effects of low to moderate doses of radiation in children. We uh, will improve radiation uh, protection and we hope to contribute to patient care and their quality of life. Um, so our ultimate goal is to improve the quality of life of children treated with medical radiation and to do that we have a consortium of 24 partners from around Europe and we all met also in Barcelona in a very nice uh, place and I would like to thank all the collaborators, partners and my team uh, at, uh, at IS Global uh, who are all very much involved in, uh, in the, all activities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Isabel. It's great to have the um, detailed background on this important study, which, as you said, is going to be really important um, for children for the years to come. Uh, so if people have questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and I guess I'll just ask one. Um, you have such a, a complicated study design with people coming in from all different disciplines. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, I, I, I may, may have missed, but kind of where is their dosimetry kind of centered in a particular location and then some of the biospecimen work and that laboratory work, is that being led by a specific subgroup? So we have, uh, we have subgroups, so they are uh, called work packages and uh, the, yeah. the the biology and the dosimetry, they are transversal, so they we really try to have people uh, work together so they have different tasks, but they we organize our uh, uh, meetings uh, regularly uh, with uh, with the full group so that there is a possibility for exchange of data and method between those involved in the radiotherapy, dosimetry for radiotherapy and dosimetry for cardiology. But yes, they are different experts. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's one question in the chat. Um, so it's just confirming that you're studying radiotherapy as well as the diagnostic doses, right? So it's radiotherapy and then the fluoroscopy. Mm -hmm. Yes. And are there, so are there people with cancer before recruitment? Um, I think the, with the radiotherapy studies, certainly those are the, um, those children are being treated for cancer. Yes, yes, sure. Yeah. Um, and in the other part, those who will, uh, will, we will exclude those who, who have cancer before uh, the treatment, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to non-cancer effects beyond, of course, the biospecimen analyses that are not directly cancer related? So we are exploring endocrine dysfunction, um, neurovascular and cardiovascular. Um, uh, with the um, cardiovascular, we are we are exploring both aspects, so biology and and um, other outcomes. So we are trying to set up uh, echocardiography, which is not uh, so easy for the neurovascular uh, uh, task. We are um, uh, uh, doing our analysis on uh, MRI. 
that we are collecting. So some of the some of the aspects can only be uh, explored prospectively, but um, but we are still uh, uh, building the code both prospectively and retrospectively. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, so as Elizabeth did, Isabel, if you'd be willing to answer uh, some final questions in the chat, that would be really helpful because. We're looking forward to going on to the final talk uh, by Dr. Ludmila Lutsko, who's a postdoctoral fellow at um, IS Global, and uh, really demonstrating the breadth of research that goes on in the, the group. Now is the shift um, to preparedness and recovery from nuclear accidents, the Shamisen recommendations. Hello, good afternoon, good morning. I'm trying to share my screen, but it looks great. Looks great now. Okay, so just back a little bit. I will speak and present the Shamisen recommendations, which were elaborated for better preparedness to and recovery from nuclear accidents. With the time I have 10 minutes, I will give you just a little taste of them, but you will be you are welcome to familiar with them, download from our page and study more in detail. So I will speak uh, mainly about Shamisen recommendation, but briefly remind uh, about Shamisen project and also link uh, about possible adaptation of these recommendations to other disaster types at the end. And Shamisen itself, it's not only a traditional Japanese musical instrument, but also it was a European project led by uh, Elizabeth Karzis from AIS Global, and the abbreviation stands for Nuclear Emergency Situation uh, for for improvement of health and medical surveillance. And we have a web page, you can also be familiar more on it. And in this project, we counted with experts and professionals with different areas from different areas, such as post accidental management, dosimeter, radiation protection, medical follow up and screening, health science, health economics, epidemiology, ethics, sociology, psychology, etc. Also, experts from Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, Japan, and UK, and all researchers from 18 institutions. This helps us to drive these recommendations in more optimal, uh, optimal way to cover all aspects of accidental management. It requires not only radiation exposure issues that normally were taken in past accidents, but also other aspects such as socioeconomical and psychological. Just to give some example why we need to take into account not only radiation exposure itself, but also emotions, for example, psychological impact. You can see here from the pictures when people, for example, are losing uh, their homes, it's not only social economical impact, it's also um, psychological uh, trauma, it's psychological loss and grief because of uh, losing their native places where they were born, even losing their tombs and cemeteries from with their ancients, so they didn't do not have even place where to meet with them again. And here in the middle picture, you can see is a it's a cemetery of villages that were burned in the 30 kilometers Chernobyl zone. So people now coming here to meet with their ancestors. It's also grief for leaving their domestic animals behind because these animals also were the members of families. And on the right picture, you can see a man, it's a so-called self, uh, self shelter who returned in his native home in the restricted 30 kilometer zone area, which is prohibited to uh, reside still. And he his words were, I survived the first world war, I survived the second world war, so I will survive radiation. And actually just to see, to show how uh, decision making processes, if they were done only on technological part and not sometimes do not lead to the most optimal way. You can see an example of people who were evacuated just because of doses, because of radiation issues, but some people, especially elder people who lived for all their life in their places, it was a big trauma shock and in both in Soviet countries and in Japan, some of these people later had very great depression and even suicide. For this reason, health and uh, recommendations we center it on, on global aspects. From one side, on the left, we have radiation exposure, which is external internal exposure, also measures for protection, shielding, but 
and again here we can count with the secondary effect of these measures like uh, i mentioned before about the evacuation or if to give a parallel with covid you know that when we are protecting against of wheat spread with social distances and other we have secondary effects on mental health issues so all this radiation and secondary are linked to another part other impacts which are stress anxiety stigma depression socioeconomical uh, lost also impacts that may derive negative impacts from information and disinformation from social media and from official sources of information for this reason a part of a basic health condition of each person public health we need and this is a buffer to count on communication education and training and counseling of people just to give an example of one of uh, Shamison, the shamison recommendation on it on thyroid uh, screening so our recommendation was not to do it on obligatory level because if people are uh, like in case of Fukushima where I pass uh, via obligatory screening on steroid some of them even didn't had support or counseling uh, to understand the screen results of this uh, informs that they received and this created more anxiety and maybe more negative impact that this result of because of this north way are very small so it was not balanced anyway the shamanism recommendations on the left you can see a booklet which you can uh, download and print it's a, it's a book also we edited um in the environmental international journal special issue dedicated to the shamanism project in many papers uh, in total will be nine uh, related to the project itself and recommendations but also to the symmetry evacuation psychological issues socioeconomical thyroid and uh, ethical uh, aspects of it i'm not able to give or to read in, the, in detail each the, uh, each of recommendation but you can see here and quickly read by yourself uh, my, while i'm presenting them On here you have a general seven general recommendation general to all uh, all phases of accident and uh, also we have 21 specific i will show you later but i would like to show that we also uh, classified this recommendation in specific area if they are not classified they are in gray like here general but we have six specific area so we had evacuation in red communication and training orange and dosimetry in violet health environments in green and epidemiology in blue three phases of accidents it is preparedness early and intermediate phases and long-term recovery and this the rest 21 uh, specific re uh, recommendation is presented in this table by area and by in column by phases of accidents just to give an example for example for evacuation in preparedness we have to plan shelter and evacuation and, and give uh, how to provide stable iodine distribution protocols and uh, during emergency itself in early intermediate phase we have to optimize timing and support for shelter and evacuation and in long-term recovery period we have to or organize arrange plans for lifting of evacuation orders that people can return as soon as possible to their native places just quickly if you wish to look through the rest of uh, recommendations here and i'm go quickly just to present how each representation looks like here you have some uh, examples so each, represent, each uh, sorry, rep recommendation has a title, which is a brief explanation of it, concise information is given in the title, but also we have three divisions of uh, why we recommend it. So it's kind of background, how it should be implemented, and in the section of who, so we recommend this relevant stakeholders should be involved, but it's not limited to it. So here you have orange, uh, recommendations for training and education, red on evacuation, health and surveillance and those assessments. And the most transversal one is the most important central to decision management processes, but also or to whole accident management was the fundamental ethical principle of doing more harm, more good, sorry, than harm should be central. And in case if we have two harms, so we should always balance and try to choose those decisions that would drive to the less harms that 
uh, that is possible. Also for general public, we, we have on our website that can be also downloaded some kind of um, more uh, explanations of recommendation on lay languages for general public. And uh, here we have infographics. Here it's in English, so we have general recommendations represented and also split for before, during and after the accident phases for them in English, but also we have it translated in Russian, Spanish, French and uh, Japanese. And in the article, in the end of article uh, presenting recommendations, the Shimes recommendation is a journal, we have an annex in a table where we suggest uh, that each recommendation, how it can be implemented to other disaster types, for example, natural, chemical, or even COVID, pandemic COVID-19. So in the last column where we have specific to radiation, if it's no, so it's a general one. So majority of them, uh, quite general and can be applied directly. And so those that were specific, like for example, those measurements can be adapted easily to other exposure measurements, if it's for chemical or for example, virus for COVID. And as a practical example of it, we adapted and issued policy brief led by Adelaida Sarukan in his global web page and the title COVID-19, what cast what can past nuclear accident to teach us? You are welcome also to read it and be familiar with it. So I hope to give you, give you some brief presentation on this recommendation and encourage you to visit and to read and study them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ludmila. It's really important to see the um, work of this consortium um, and the great recommendations. Uh, so there's one question in the chat so far. Um, with the EPA recommending evacuation at 10 millisieverts, is it possible to compare this to the psychosocial and psychosomatic harm to assess a risk relevance on this policy? I, I think in, the, in this aspect, when we, we are considered only doses, we do not stratify maybe for these needs that I mentioned on this psychological needs. So it should be more individual approach. So in case of people like elderly people, maybe for the rest of life, and cumulative doses they would receive will be not so high. And for, for them, the risk of staying at their homes would be much less than if they were will be evacuated if they, um, you know, if they do not accept this change or cannot be bearing this trauma. So I think uh, it's like in medicine, we are going to more personalized, personalized type of medicine. So maybe here we need to also approach to have this approach, not only considering doses, but kind of individual approach of uh, taking into account people's also opinion on it. And I, I also appreciated seeing some of the details on the epidemiology recommendations and knowing some of the interests of this um, of ISO Red members. Uh, I was wondering if you could just comment a little bit on some of the challenges of surveillance. I noticed in the recommendations, I think it was recommendation five in the slide that you had just shown about the kind of emphasis on registries and linkages for disease monitoring as opposed to active surveillance. Can you just comment a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, and our recommendations were on the preparedness phase. It's good to have these registries already uh, arranged because not all countries have, for example, maybe a cancer cancer we have, but maybe not cardiovascular disease, other type of disease. So, it's good to have these registers and harmonize them, centralize somehow that we can use as uh, further for epidemiological studies. And uh, during emergency, also maybe it's difficult to keep them, but for example, uh, when an emergency occurs, you don't have time to improve some protocols because in some countries, uh, protocols, ethical protocols or studies uh, may last for three months to, to have them. Maybe some kind of protocols for, uh, could be also uh, done a priori and et cetera. As for health events, uh, also if you return to psychological issue, it was important to consider also people's well-being. And sometimes, for example, do not put title of uh, servants or some projects that you put not very clear or maybe abusive or somehow, somehow people can offend by this title. So try to consider this maybe tiny issue, but to, to, feel, uh, to make people feel better, not only just experimental bodies for this. 
This is terrific. Um, so I want to be mindful of the time because it's just a minute after the hour. And so uh, in the chat, I'm just going to put two quick notes. Um, one is that our next webinar we're delighted to announce will be on the 6th of July at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, where Gustav Roussy, uh, the group from Gustav Roussy will be presenting, and that link will be circulated shortly. Um, and as always, if you're interested in presenting uh, in one of these webinars, please contact Rania Kosti, and I put her email in the chat. Um, we have a number of uh, groups in the coming months, um, but then slots thereafter, and we really appreciate uh, these terrific talks from IS Global um and showcasing the terrific work that you all are doing um, so thank you to everyone and thank you very much to see you next month thank you very much thank you